Mesoamerican quiz time. Aztec or Mayan? Aztec or Mayan? Aztec or Mayan? One more, Aztec or Mayan? Believe it or not, these are two totally different languages. Well, almost. There are fundamental differences, but there's also one of history's strangest linguistic mind melts happening here. So often I find Aztecs and Mayans mentioned in the same breath or the same keystrokes, so I can almost forgive you for not knowing the difference between the languages. Almost. But after we're done here, no excuses. Okay, first, we're not dealing with two languages here. Hardly. See, Aztec, which usually goes by the name Nahuatl, clear, or I guess clear speech, is just one branch at the southern edge of a much larger family tree. The Udo Aztecan language family stretches from Idaho in the U.S. all the way down to El Salvador. Classical Nahuatl is the language spoken by the people you're probably thinking of when I say Aztecs. But the modern Nahuan branch actually includes a whole cluster of closely related languages and dialects. Mayan is another story. Actually, lots of stories, because it's an entire language family. Each one of these is a Mayan language. Just to keep you on your toes, speakers of some of these individual languages call their own language Maya, even when we don't. To linguists, this is Yucatec, but it's really Mayatan. This one here, Chontal, is just the Nahuatl word Chontali, meaning foreigner. What do they themselves call it, though? Well, usually Yucatan, correct language, but also Mayan. To spot some differences between Aztec and Mayan, compare basic words. My last video was all about the tactical use of the languages in the Spanish conquest. Cortés, Aguilar, and the star of the show, Malintzin, used Nahuatl and Chontal to turn an empire against itself. I'll be pulling examples from these same two languages to show off Aztec versus Mayan. Just a heads up though, I have a little more experience with Yudo Aztecan than Maya. I once got into another rather different Yudo Aztecan language and I've spent more time with classical Nahuatl than any one Mayan language. Hopefully that explains any glitches in pronunciation. Let me start by handpicking things that stand out about their sounds. Nahuatl is known for that distinctive t and for this saltillo skip or glottal stop that's often between a vowel and a consonant. It's awkward at first, but try tling and skipping to get a feel for it for yourself. Mexicat, tlatoani. Besides a couple affricates and a difference between a regular k and a qu made by rounding your lips, nothing else is too scary in the pronunciation department. Nahuatl only has four vowels, no u, but it does distinguish short ones from long ones. A, a, i, i. Also, there's this relentless second to last syllable stress, pam, 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 tenochtitlan. Yucatan, on the other hand, has six vowels, and its consonants include the ever so Mayan ejective stops that build up and release air pressure. Call them exotic, call them aggressive, personally I like them, but they're on full display in this Mayan language. So, let me try this. Chich versus chich. Pos and pos. Basic nouns in Maya are a simple affair, often just one syllable. So nouns like chu and na are ready to use. No fanciness, no plural endings. Of course, this makes compounding super common. Not necessarily longest word in the world kind of compounding, but still. chu na Nouns that refer to people are often prefixed with a male or ish female, even when that's not information you're used to including in English. Ishkai, ahkai, ahyokutan, ishyokutan, ahchame. What about Nahuatl nouns? Well, I hope you've been practicing your tl because you're gonna need it. On their own, Nahuatl nouns have a base plus an ending, like me shikatl. Depending on the last letter in the root, the noun suffix might take another shape, which is why house is kali, not kaltl. If the noun is alive, it has an animate plural. So one me shikat, many me shika. Inanimate kali stays kali. Your house isn't alive, is it? Now comes the fun part. Nahuatl nouns love to be possessed by possessive prefixes. Knock off the ending, attach a pronoun prefix, and the party's at nokal, my house, or mokal, your house, but definitely not at nokali. Similar pronoun bits are very valuable in Yokotan, but not in a way that's so bound up with every noun and makes it change its shape. Na, ana, una. It's possible to think of Aztec and Mayan core words like nouns and verbs as sentence builders in their own right. 
Check out what happens when you build a sentence using just the noun and adding the subject marker to it, like going from na and una to unaet in Maya, or me shikat and ti me shikat in Aztec. I spent some time with nouns and possessives because this is an inkling of a similarity worth keeping in mind. We'll build on it later. When it comes to verbs, both languages care about transitivity. In Nahuatl, you take a verb like wetsi, maka, or kwa, and tack on a subject. These are the same subjects we use to build sentences out of nouns. Ti me shikat, ti wetsi, ti maka. You can then add in your object. Ni maka, nik maka, ni kwa, ni kwa, or even ni tlakwa with that fancy unknown object. I think transitivity is an even bigger player in Mayan, beyond just the shape of the verb. In some tenses aspects, Mayan displays something called ergativity. The short story is this. If a Mayan verb is intransitive, then its subject looks like an object. Take a transitive verb, akushi, where you are the subject. And you're still the subject in the intransitive verb, weyet, even though you look different. This sets Mayan apart from both English and Nahuatl, since we use the same subjects for transitive and intransitive verbs. I am the same in I eat it, ni kwa, and in I fall, ni wetsi. Accusative languages versus ergative languages, that probably just made your eyes glaze over. Let me resuscitate you with something easier, prepositions. You know these guys, you got them in English. Chontal's got them too, and it uses them for location and relation. So if you remember, taquin was money, we can just say tok taquin for with money. That's not how Nahuatl works though. It uses postfixes for these kinds of time and place relationships. Like the one for togetherness is wan, mo wan, with you. Or location, ko, calco, in the house. These go beyond our prepositions though. Switch off your Indo-European mind and think internationally for this one. Take a little word that seems atomic, unbreakable even, like and. Yeah, in Nahuatl, and is a multi-part construction built using a postfix, iwan, its togetherness, or with it. Okay, you are officially a linguistic warrior for sticking with me. That was just a random grammar sampling, but you now have a gist of the differences between these languages. Time for the payoff. With your refined grammatical palette, let's rewind and play the game again. Aztec or Mayan? Aztec or Mayan? Aztec or Mayan? <laughs> there we go. But if you couldn't tell them apart before, I don't think it was just sheer ignorance. You probably had hazy ideas of similarities and no real understanding of the differences. But there was something to those similarities, something deep. When you characterize a language, you probably go straight for what we call the genetic relationship. What kind of a language is Spanish? Why, it's a romance language. What about classical Nahuatl? Yudo Aztecan, of course. Chontal Yucatan, that's Mayan. All true. And we can go around breaking up pre-Columbian Mesoamerica into this patchwork of distinct color-coded language families. If we stop there, though, we'll miss out on the best part of the story. There's another factor that majorly influences languages in an almost bizarrely stealthy kind of way. When languages, even totally and utterly unrelated ones, live side by side for a long time, they start to exchange stuff. Not just, can I bar the sugar or can I have your chocolate and chilies kind of stuff. I mean, sure, a Mayan language might borrow Aztec words, just as people all over the region were sharing goods and ideas, but that didn't leave a huge dent. Instead of surface stuff like words and sounds, the languages of Mesoamerica started to trade structure. I don't want your nouns. I want the way your nouns and pronouns work to influence my nouns and pronouns. Linguists call this phenomenon a Sprachbund, a language area. Aztec and Mayan participated in one of history's greatest, the Mesoamerican language area. Show and tell time. What kinds of linguistic mind melds were happening here? First, a simple one, word order. Mesoamerica likes to keep verbs away from the end of a sentence. Verb, subject, object is very Mayan. And even though classical Nahuatl was pretty free in how it let you order words, it tended to like verb, subject, object, or even verb, object, subject. The languages that surround Mesoamerica, though, they totally disagree. They had no problem with a verb final syntax, with subject, object, verb being very, very common. And those possessives? They come back full force with a kind of awkward Mesoamerican way of saying that somebody owns something. It's like this, her house the woman, their bones the dogs. In Aztec, I think you'd say ical in siwat, 
inomiu in chichime. But it works the same way all over. Of course, that core words build sentences concept from earlier comes back here. So have fun with examples like ikalin mosiwao. Back to Mesoamerican postpositions and prepositions, those time-space references love to include body parts. So instead of saying inside, why not say itik, its stomach? For around, use itenko, on its lips. Or try maya pam, head, for in front, like pamotot at head of house, for in front of the house. They even count the same way. Not with your decimal system. Their system is base 20. Aztec sempowali, 20, is literally just one count. Units like 80 are easy, just counted scores. Napowali, four counts. As a consequence, your major Mesoamerican milestones weren't hundreds or thousands, but things like 20 squared and 20 cubed. There are separate words for these, like the old Mayan bak or nahuatl sentzontli. All of these and more are features of Mesoamerica. Some are even rare outside of it, even in the very same language families. The way to explain them is to look at how these languages converged around the very same traits. I find this fascinating. In a way, it's like you can proudly keep the look and feel of your language, but behind the scenes, we'll all agree to work differently. Similarly, not differently. <laughs> well, thanks for making it through this grammar class. I know it's a bit of a switch, but I hope it helps you appreciate the story from last time. Or, you know, the next time you study a modern Mayan language. Modern Mayan language? Wait, did the Mayans, like, disappear or something? Yeah, and I think that happened when the world ended back in December 2012. Ha, <laughs> no, they didn't. But that's a story for another time. Stick around and subscribe for language.